Okay, as, as you can see from the cover, tonight I'm going to talk about um, small ancient, uh, often forgotten because they are uh, small and being small sometimes means not being that relevant, but actually surprisingly rich Tanzanian rainforests. Um, and I'm going to use amphibians as a model to, to tell a little bit of the story of these forests because amphibians are quite special. They, are on the they have been on the planet for a very long time. They're very sensitive to changes. They're not really able to move across different places. Uh, they're linked to water. Uh, so they are actually the perfect organisms uh, to, to tell a story because they are, they are, their story that's being shaped by the story of the mountains. Uh, by the way, the frog that you see on the cover is, uh, it has actually a name, but actually based on still unpublished studies, it doesn't belong to the species that actually uh, is considered to belong now. It doesn't even belong to that genus and is probably belongs to a, a completely new family. And, um, and it's not an isolated case. So it means that in this forest, there's still a lot to learn. And, um, and Amphibial will tell us a little bit of this uh, remarkable story. Let's start from uh, a map, which is always a good starting point. Uh, on your, this is a map of forest cover in the central part of Africa. As you can see on the left and the center, there's the big uh, Congo Basin rainforest. And in the, in the red circle, there's the Eastern Arc and Southern Rift forest of Tanzania, which are the forest I'm going to, to talk about tonight. Um, the red arrow, I put the red arrow actually to remember myself to say something about that. Uh, the red arrow says that those forests are very close to the Indian Ocean. So basically throughout their life, throughout their history, they have been um, particularly wet because throughout climatic fluctuation, the Indian Ocean kept the eastern side of those forests wet. And keeping a forest wet means keeping the forest stable means that when the overall climate is very dry, those forests didn't dry up. And this is a key information for the story I'm going to tell. Another, another thing is that, as you can see, uh, they are very small. But, uh, for example, if we consider the forest in DRC, the, the rough um, extent of that forest is, a, is about 1.2 million square kilometers. In those 1.2 million square kilometers, there's about 250 species of amphibians. Those forests in Tanzania are now about 3,500 square kilometers, so many, many, many times smaller, but they have 200 species of, of, of amphibians. So, means that uh, they are really packed with a lot of species. Um, another interesting thing is that in DRC, 59 species are endemic. So they live only there and nowhere else on the planet. In, those, in, the, in the Eastern Arc and Southern Rift forest of Tanzania, 121 species are endemic. So more than, more than double. And of course, there are reasons for, that, for this. But let's, let's introduce a little bit what's happening here. Okay. 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 Uh, chameleons are uh, a group of main forest animals. It means that if you go to a forest, you, you could see a lot of chameleons. If you go to a dry area, you might encounter one or two species. 
while in a forest you, may, you might encounter 10 or 12 different species. Madagascar is by far the richest place on planet in terms of chameleon species, and the second is Tanzania. Uh, and Tanzania has uh, more than twice the number of species of many other African countries, even countries with a lot of forests. But this is not the only example. Also primates. If I would think to a place with the highest number of primates in Africa, again, I would think to DRC or Republic of Congo or maybe Cameroon. Actually, again, it's Tanzania. And the reason, again, is these tiny, tiny forests. So let's try to, throughout, uh, I mean, um, let's try to, to tell a little bit of the story of this forest and why they are that rich and actually what are the challenges to preserve them and to, and to highlight the role that they had and they can have in the future. Okay, so as I said, uh, we will be guided by amphibians because they, they, they can provide a really good guidance because they are very sensitive to changes and basically, they are not really good in moving across habitats, which are not exactly what they need. Means that when they are somewhere, they usually get stuck. And get this stu getting stuck means uh, piling up in, 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 in their DNA information about what happened through time. I, I don't know if you can see it, but I mean, the red arrow is pointing to the top of a mountain. I took this picture from the top of the Lukwangule Plateau in the Uluguru Mountains for, the, for who knows Tanzania. Uh, if you drive out Dar es Salaam towards Iringa or Dodoma, the first big town you reach is Morogoro. And Morogoro is at the foothills of the Uluguru Mountains. If you climb all the way up to the Lukwangule Plateau at about 2,500 meters, you can see the top of the Nguru Mountains, which are about 60 kilometers away. And um, so I, I, started, I started working on the Tanzanian forest in 1997 in the southern Uzungwa. And then I started moving to other forests, uh, to other mountain blocks and other forests. And every time I was driving from Morogoro to Dodoma, on my right side, I was seeing these Nguru Mountains. And I told myself quite a few times, I want to go there for two reasons. One was, I mean, they looked great. I mean, with rocky peaks, 2,400 meters high. And in, uh, during clean days, you could really see the forest covers on the top. But also I knew that incredibly, they were not biologically explored. So basically, till 2004, only the, the lower foothills were uh, subject of some field survey, but no one went on top of those mountains to look what in, that, in those forests was still kept as a secret. So uh, this is just to tell you how the forest looked like. This is a forest on Nguru, in at about 2000 meters and is one of the wettest places in west in east africa with more than 3000 3500 millimeters of rain every year and if you climb all the way to the top of the mountain i mean to the to the higher part of the mountain forest it looks like um, a cloud forest really wet full of mosses and lichens not easy to walk across because uh, despite being a major forest, I mean, the, the, the vegetation is really covering everything, but incredibly beautiful. Um, to me was, when I saw that, it was one of the most beautiful forests I've ever seen. Actually, even now is one of the most beautiful forests I've ever seen because it was actually matching. As Chris said, I, I think uh, I've been a researcher for many, many years just to have an excuse to go to places like this. And I think the main driver was to try to match the idea I had of a rainforest when I was a kid. I thought of a, about the rainforest as the place, you know, with 
a lot of different plants, a lot of different animals where everything could happen. And I really wanted to do that. And I think I spent many years to try to match the image I had in my mind uh, with actual forest on the planet. And, and the, the forest of the, of the mountain layer of the Nguru Mountains were one of the, was one of the most, uh, the, the, one of the best match. If you go a little bit lower down, I mean, across the Eastern Arc, the forest cover got reduced uh, enormously during the last centuries and decades because of human impact, because of deforestation. So very few places are still uh, a good sub-mountain forest. Just north of the Nguru, there's the Ngu Mountains, quite close. And in the Ngu Mountains, there's still a good chunk of sub-mountain forest. And this is one of the three in that sub-mountain forest. And probably across most of the Eastern Arc, at around 1,000 meters of elevation, trees like this were common. Now they are very rare. Okay, but let's go back to the Nguru. This is a, um, um, a picture taken from an airplane of the, of the mountain, at about, of the mountain forest at about 2,200 meters. Of course, as I said at the beginning, they are all very small compared, for example, to the, big of, to the big forest of the central part of Africa or the western part of Africa. Usually, there are fragments not bigger than 100 or 200 square kilometers, often also 50 or 40 or 30 square kilometers. And as you can see from here, they, they just touch the, the farmland because the reason why they're that small is because of climate fluctuations. So, Forest has been, the forest cover has been naturally expanding and contracting, but mainly because now they're being cut because, I mean, uh, uh, a forest is, it has been seen as a resource, food, uh, construction poles, and, and a fertile soil. So it has been replaced by cultivations. Anyway, in 2004, I decided to go to survey that forest. At that time, it was my job. So trying to document the biodiversity of remote and unknown forest, and by documenting the biodiversity, bring those forests to the surface and highlight the needs of conservation. Because science is funny. Uh, and we will, I will tell something about that later. But basically, if a forest is not documented, as if a species has no name, despite is actually real, it really, it, it, it out there, for science is not existing yet. So we, for, for example, we know of many species which are in a, in a specific forest, they are threatened by extinction, by deforestation or other type of activities, but since they have no name yet, they don't exist. They are not into the statistics and the, 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 um, the organization which works on this, they cannot take them into the account because they have no name. So formally, they don't exist, but they are actually there. Anyway, at that time, 2004, October, the start, the very start of the, of the small, of the short rain, I decided to go up. At that time, but also here, I mean, to go to a place like this, you have to, basically you go to the nearest village, uh, on at the foothill of the mountain, you sit down with the chief and the um, and the village leaders. You explain what you want to do. Of course, you need your all your permits from the government, and then you explain that you need their help. You need their help because they know the forest. Not always, sometimes it depends on the place. Um, but you need people helping to carry the stuff. You need a cook. You need a system because you know something could happen, and you you need to be assisted. So it means that you put together a group of people who partly, I mean, some will just carry, help carry the stuff up, up slope and uh, to, 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 the, to the camp, which has to be identified. And some of them will stay with you. At that time, I was used to stay in the forest like three or four weeks in one, in one go. And this is wonderful because basically you establish 
incredibly nice relationship with people and you you learn about their perception of the forest their perception of the animals uh, looking for by the, i mean collecting information about biodiversity means also to be able to move quite uh, quickly and easily because by roaming around you can find new places or maybe you can want to go uh, higher up so we were used to set up very light camps which is good in terms of being flexible and able to move quite quickly but also if you stay three or four weeks in the forest means if it's gonna rain too much means being being wet and you, all your clothing and everything for weeks or for many days which can actually make your stay in the forest quite difficult this this is the camp i the first camp i did on the nguru mountains in 2004. anyway what uh, the reason why i have decided to talk about the gurus is because in my experience was an an extraordinary journey so we started from from a certain altitude from a, a village a couple of hours walking from from the forest edge and then we started going up means a long you know maybe 15 people myself a cook a couple of assistants and people helping to carry the stuff so we started going up and after a few hours i've seen this this little brown thing in the leaf litter was still day and so i picked it up i uh, i realized that is a, a viviparous toad in the genus nectophrenoides i know them very well because uh, also before that i've been working on them quite extensively in other forests and also in terms of uh, analysis on them and publications so i saw it i looked at it and i thought wow this is new to science this is a, a new species to science and was strange because it was during the day in the leaf litter and usually they are nocturnal not easy to see and by the way this is still with no name and you will understand why uh, very soon um, because usually when you find a new a species new to science you can be quite excited because it's always great finding something new and usually you want to describe it soon means to to do all the process to demonstrate throughout the scientific uh, methodology that is actually new to science i mean dna analysis morphological analysis and publish a paper saying that and once you name it and you publish the description it, be, it becomes an existing animal also formally so it can be included into conservation assessment and and things like that so i kept walking and after a few hours we got to a place which to me was good for establishing the first camp and while i was uh, removing a little bit of leaf litter to set up my tent tent I saw this thing and I picked it up and I thought wow this is new to science so the first two animals I've seen were new to science and then I picked this and it was new to science and then that that, that night I've seen this and it was new to science and then I've seen this and it was new to science and in the coming few days i've seen this and this and many others and all of them were new to science basically every single animal i've seen above 1700 meters was new to science and endemic so living nowhere else of the nguru mountains the interesting thing is that at that time the nguru mountains because no actual research was carried out on that place was they were quite low down in the ranking of the most important forest of tanzania and during that time there was a project an endowment fund uh, enabling some uh, um, evaluation of the forest value and and of course the government was part of it uh, with the aim 
of uh, establishing new nature reserves to, in order to protect the most valuable forest of Tanzania. So Nguru was really low down and we knew that. It was kind of a, a, a forgotten place. No one really investigated and very few publication about it. So it was like, you know, a mountain, of course, with forest, but apparently much poorer than others. Actually it was richer than many of the most famous Eastern Arc mountain forests like Uzambara or Ulukul. So we decided to run and to publish as, 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 as uh, quick as possible information on the gurus in order to make sure that they would have been included at, at, uh, and, and, and ranking high enough in the places that deserve to become a nature reserve. So we published uh, quite a lot of um, uh, papers, but most of those species, because during those three weeks, I found 17 species new to science, and most of them are still with no name. Because, I mean, um, publishing new species takes a lot of time, and sometimes you have comparison material and you can do it quite quickly. So other times it's not that easy. But uh, actually the publications themselves were, uh, appeared, were published quite uh, a few years later, but we managed to get something called gray literature, so a, a report uh, stating and, 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 and um, uh, describing the outstanding biological value of the Nguru Mountains and they were included. So they went up the ranking and they became one of the nature reserves. Okay, why the Nguru Mountains are that rich? The Nguru Mountains themselves have about 53 or 54 amphibian species, which is two thirds of all the amphibians of Uganda, for example, okay? And twice all the amphibians we have in Italy. And one, uh, uh, one um, a quarter of all the amphibians of the Republic of Congo in a place not bigger than 200 square kilometers. Why that? Okay, as I said before, the Eastern Arc Mountains are, they had the influence of the Indian Ocean, which kept them kind of warmer and wetter during climatic fluctuations. So while the rest of East Africa was drying up and forest disappearing, on the eastern slopes of these mountains, the forest was, were kept uh, in place by this wet and, and warm current uh, coming from the Indian Ocean. Also, they are very ancient. The, forest, the mountain themselves, I mean, there's some debate on the actual age, but let's say that they have been there for dozens of millions of years. And on top of these mountains, because of the effect of the Indian Ocean, um, the forest themselves stayed in place for probably something between 20 and 30 million years. Means that if you go to Tanzania, and you walk up to this forest, you enter a place that has been there for 20 million years. And for 20 million years, species has been piling up, diversifying, finding the way to fit into new niches constantly. For example, in other places like here in Italy, glaciations wiped out almost everything quite regularly. Or in other places like most of the Congo Basin, the forest dried up and a lot of animals got extinct. If you look at this picture, the, the red spots are where there's the highest diversity. The red spots are where the forests are more ancient. Uh, actually, I mean, this show where the forests are more diverse with more species. And now we are talking vertebrates but actually means that the forests in those places have been there for a longer time. So where you have the red and the green in the current forest area, 
forests are being more subject to climatic fluctuations. So uh, uh, when, when the, the overall climate was drier, forests tended to disappear. But in the Gulf of Guinea, in the, north, in the Ituri area, in the southern um, uh, 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 Central African Republic, along the Albertine Rift, and as you can see, along the eastern arc of Tanzania, uh, forests were much more stable. And stability and age is one of the main driver of diversity. So when you have a place that can stay there and without changing for millions of years, you might have, especially a forest with a lot of niches and production, so there's a lot of energy in a forest. Basically, species can pile up uh, in an in a, uh, exceptional way. Okay, so we see that the Eastern Arc Mountains, like other few areas across the forest belt of, of the central part of African continent, is one of the places with an exceptional richness. Uh, but there's another thing. If, you look, if we look at amphibian endemism, and this is true for all the animals that are not good in moving across different habitats. Could be millipedes, could be many plants, could be uh, spiders or shrews, small mammals, sometimes also small birds. Basically what happened is that when you have a mountain with a very difficult terrain, and, and this mountain is separated by, uh, uh, by, from other mountains by intervening lowlands. Amphibians and all the animals which are depending on the forest environment cannot move, cannot move from a mountain to another. So, uh, as you can see, the level of endemism in the Eastern Arc Mountains of Tanzania is similar to only one place, I mean, few places in Cameroon and, and few places in Madagascar. So there's no other places across the entire African continent in which certain special conditions kept a very special situation where, where uh, amphibians and other animals can uh, have been diversifying and through and 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 they got completely isolated with no possibility to move away from the place they are being evolving so why that many okay as i said long term stability promote both lineage persistence and species diversification lineage is basically like the is the uh, I'm, uh, I'm sure you all know what a lineage is, even because I, I don't know how to explain in English. Is basically the, the link that keep together all the closely related species. And a lineage can diversify because of stability. So basically, uh, uh, individuals and population try to find new solutions to fill up new niches. Um, this is possible when the, line, the lineage can persist, means when the forest stays there for a long time. When this happens, animals try, it's like, it's like, I mean, it's like a market. I mean, you have a market with resources and you have to find the right niche in order to survive. Um, so what happened is that Amphibians, which are linked to water for reproduction, can try, if they have enough timing to do it, to find new solutions. At the beginning, I told you that the first animal, the first frog toad I found while climbing up the Nguru Mountains was a viviparous toad. And this is quite exceptional. There's viviparous toads only in Tanzania and in a tiny place between Cote d'Ivoire and... Um, and uh, Liberia. So, for an amphibian, trying to avoid too, uh, too uh, heavy competition with others could mean 
tr find a new niche. And finding a new niche could be trying to find a solution that allow the, the, the animal to move away from water. So having time to explore possibilities means becoming something else. In fact, in this forest, there are several amphibians which move away from water and they became terrestrialized. So they lay eggs in the, in the, in the soil and from those eggs, toadlets or froglets can, can, uh, are, are, can hatch or even more, there are amphibians which became viviparous. So they give birth to life, to, to live toadlets. Like the image you see on the, on the top right is a newborn nectophrenoides, viviparous toad. Actually, also that one, an undescribed species. The one in the, in the, in the um, uh, right, uh, down right is actually a probreviceps, a fossorial animal which lay eggs in, in chambers in the soil and from those eggs, small probreviceps will, will hatch. Uh, another important thing which I will explain now is that um, the shape of the mountain. So the Eastern Art Mountains are isolated mountain blocks with savanna, with lowland savanna in between means that after, if I'm an amphibian, I've been for, you know, a million years in a forest with a lot of humidity at a certain altitude, I want to move away, I actually can't. I'm not able, from a physiological point of view, to go down the slope, to cross a dry savanna and to go up to another mountain. So I'm stuck there, it means that I have to keep competing with other amphibians and find solution except exactly where I am. In the Albertine Rift, for example, which is super rich, but in terms of certain group of animals like amphibians, much less rich than the Eastern Arc Mountains, the fact that the mountains are, have a different shape, so they're more peaks with very high uh, hilly landscape between peaks at about 1,000 or 1,500 meters, means that during fluctuations, uh, also, the areas between peaks were covered in forests. So animals kept, uh, kept moving across the different mountain peaks. Means that they kept gene flow, so they were not isolated. So they didn't diversify that much. Um, and that's another reason why those mountains are that rich. Okay, let's go quickly. You don't need to, I mean, I don't need to say much about this, but just to go back to the concept of lineage. So basically when we try to put species in relationship between each other, we build a phylogenetic tree. And a phylogenetic tree is a way like uh, trying to reconstruct the history of a family, you know, with uh, parents and grandparents and so on. So going back in time, and trying to trace back all the relationship. Um, but let's think for a moment to what a species is. A species is a combination of genetic, functional, morphological, physiological, and behavioral adaptation. So a species, like our, also ourselves, is a multi-layer functional organism, okay? And all these things are what what a species achieve throughout evolution. For example, the way we are is because we are being, we, 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 we got shaped by evolution. So we found solution throughout, through time to survive to the challenges we have encountered. But we cannot say that we are very successful because we are very young. I mean, ourselves as we, as we are today, we are, let's say, younger than a million years. Actually, much younger, but let's say younger than a million years. Some of the species out there can be, can have been on, on the planet for 5, 10, 15, 20 million years. And there are reasons. Okay, let's look at this. Um, and these affect the way we think conservation. The orange frog, you, you can see that 
his lineage is uh, very long and is not shared since, I mean, since the very root with any other. The green frogs have the root, basically the, the amount of evolution they share with uh, other frogs is, is uh, much bigger. But the orange frog have a huge amount of known shared evolution. It means that we have an organism that maybe for 50 million years have been evolving and finding solution to all the challenges it encountered and succeed. And it's still there. So if you think when we want to preserve something, what we want to really preserve is the evolution contained into organisms, plants, animals, and ecosystems that have been, have been shaping all of this. Uh, so it means that in some very tiny, ancient, stable places, you have a frog that if you count that, for example, often when we say this is a very biodiverse place because there's a lot of species, but not every species count the same because you can find an animal, for example, a frog, but also many other type of animals that contain, contain an amount of evolution not shared with anyone else, which is unique and extremely valuable. It means that if you, if you lose that frog, you lose a lot of evolutionary history. If you lose one of the green frogs, you, you lose just that uh, green part of the branch because more, all the other evolutionary history is shared with the other three, three, three frogs, three green frogs. Let me explain you by using this. Um, in Italy, we have a very popular car, the Cinquecento, Fiat Cinquecento means 500, but we call it Cinquecento. So Fiat Cinquecento, was designed in 1957. And what I can say, the design was great because it's exactly the same thing. Basically out there, every car has to compete with other cars and has to, to fit the taste of the buyers, okay? Me, and today we still have Fiat Cinquecento. In 2020, it's slightly different, but basically the design is the same. It means that that design was really successful. It went through a lot of evolutionary challenges. People changed the way they see the car, the way they use the car, the market changed, but Fiat Cinquecento went throughout all of that and is still alive. It means that is. A, sub, a super successful organism. And we have a lot, a lot to learn from that. For example, in 1985, Fiat Duna was designed and it didn't, it didn't go that well. In fact, it got extinct a few years later. This is true for across a lot of different type of things. But what I'm saying is we should look at certain specific places with the very special eyes. Because even if they are small, if, even if they compare, I mean, in terms of number of species, maybe they can have less than others. But if they have certain characteristics like stability, habitat stability, persistence, and, and they are very ancient, they might contain some of the most exceptional example of evolution on the planet. And evolution means being successful. And we have a lot to learn from there. And now that we can um, analyze DNA, we can learn a lot from a successful organism because what we are doing is to put ourselves at risk. And understanding how things work can help, can help us to shape our future. What I'm saying is that in a super, a healthy system with a lot of species, a lot of relationships, uh, things very easily go right. So, and the system out there is what actually sustain us all. Now we are 
uh, simplifying the system through loss of diversity, redundancy, complexity, res resilience. So we are creating a system that can actually fail to sustain us. Um, learning from those species which went through incredible challenges and for example we are going throughout we are going through soon actually we are already going through but soon will be worse uh, a quite remarkable period of climate change some of those species went through already and they were very sensitive sensitive but they they made it so they can teach us how to do it how to make it even if I have to say that what we are actually doing is uh, stupid enough that also what we can learn from a frog that survived 50 million years is probably not enough to, to turn what is going to happen into something that we can really face successfully. Uh, okay, of course, I, I learned that always we have to give a little bit of hope. And the message of hope is from Frank Zappa. I'm sure many of you know who Frank Zappa is. And it, it says that we have to really start thinking that we have to deviate from the current system because no progress is possible without deviation. Thank you. Truly a spectacular lecture. Uh, it's not a talk. It's a classic lecture. Thank you very much. <laughs> no, it's superb. I, and I shall use the YouTube in my master's course. Um, I know the Utsungwas very well. Um, I worked in the Kilimbero Valley for many years. And the destruction on the ecotones are driven by mainly charcoal, the, the endless quest for charcoal. You will know that the chop line um, when I was still there, was uh, beyond Morogoro for charcoal just to Dar es Salaam. And I wonder if one could possibly think, uh, that you're not going to change the culture of using charcoal, but if one could possibly think of, of starting an initiative to use more efficient stoves, because this will be the eventual death of these mountains, the Chop, chop, chop. I mean, the ecotones are stark, as you showed. Um, there is no gradual um, succession to Savannah. It's just a, a straight line. And I think that um, one of the most important things in Tanzania would be to, to look at the efficient use of charcoal, because you're not going to stop it. Yes, uh, I fully agree. And I mean, charcoal is the, the, main, the main threat to many of the woodland and forests. In, along the Kilombero Valley, there's already quite a few initiatives introducing um, efficient stoves to villagers and run by TFCG and another group called Mazingira. Uh, I think, especially for the forest, it has been coupled with a, a little bit more of law enforcement, maybe a mild one, but uh, what should stop is and there's a lot of great people in those places, also in the villages, but of course they need resources, they need um, uh, what, and, and they are used to do certain things. So I think we need to combine giving them alternatives and also to control more the boundaries and what happened in the forest. For example, uh, okay. A positive thing is that since the, the Udungwa National Park was established, a lot of population of uh, species like the Abodiker increased very rapidly, so went back to good numbers. In the Udungwa scar, this to me is one of the most valuable forest fragment in the continent. Still, we, because it's not under patrol, uh, in the Zungwa Scarp, uh, logging, I mean, local logging and, and, and uh, encroachment and uh, because of charcoal and poaching still ongoing. Uh, we, as PAMS, we are actually planning to start working in those areas because they are su such an incredible place. Uh, just sorry, I'm hogging time, but this is the second thing is the 
there should be an overall planning in the making of roads because in my view roads are one of the biggest drivers of biodiversity destruction in Tanzania. You make a road, charcoal gum comes out. Yes, unfortunately the road that run along the Udzungwa foothills that cross Ufakara is getting better and better. So <laughs> it's going the other way. Thank you. But of course, yeah, thank you, Dave. Uh, Michaela, yeah, I, I absolutely love your talk and um, seeing those frogs and toads and oh, absolutely amazing. Um, what I didn't quite get is where exactly are those Nguru Mountains in Tanzania? Um, location? Okay, let's say that if you, if you think to uh, Dar es Salaam and Arusha, okay, in between, if you drive from Dar es Salaam uh, towards Arusha, at some point you start crossing the so-called Masai Steppe. Okay? Yeah. And uh, west of the, of the road, there's the big expanse of the Masai Steppe. Okay? In the Masai Steppe, there's the Nguru Mountains and the Ngu Mountains. So they are actually quite out of main roads, but they're not, they not far from the main roads. The, the nearest town is called Turiani. Actually, I think that they haven't been surveyed till 2004, just because there's several mountain blocks and these ones were less easy to reach because it was a long and quite bad rough road to get there. And, and they were not well known. Uh, so, but basically they are in the central, central, I mean, in the, yeah, in, in the Masai Steppe, in fact, during the, 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 the dry season, especially in at the, lower, the lower altitude in Nguru and also in Ngu, you have elephants and buffaloes getting into the forest from the Masai Steppe. Uh, 